So yeah, today I'm, I'm speaking about the work which is joined with Ben Fairman, who is a uh, postdoc in Oxford. And uh, there's a lot of surrounding work, uh, a lot of the work also joined with Takis Suganidis and ongoing work, work with uh, Nicholas Deer. Um, right, so the plan of my talk would be to spend actually quite a bit of time on the motivation of the class of stochastic partial differential equations that I'm suggesting to consider here. Uh, given that we have a broad audience and uh, yeah, many of you may not have a um, uh, uh, background in stochastic PDEs, I think that's probably a good idea. And this will also explain the link of, of this talk to the, uh, to the concept of this workshop. So yeah, this will be the first part. So hopefully after the first part, we should have an idea of... Um, why the class of stochastic PDs that I'm uh, considering is uh, relevant and in which sense. And then I'm going to move to the more math part of the talk, of the talk uh, to establish a large deviation principle for this class of uh, stochastic PDs, which will then uh, turn out to be a problem actually more in PDE theory, that is to prove where post was instability for a class of uh, parabolic hyperbolic uh, PDEs with irregular coefficients. Okay, so let's uh, start with the introduction. So the introduction uh, would be to give uh, sort of the general scope of uh, how nonlinear SPDs appear in um, non-equilibrium statistical physics. So this would be a general scheme which uh, you, can, you can start with any microscopic uh, system, basically. You could start uh, with Boltzmann, uh, like uh, hard sphere interactions or the cut system. And uh, here, to, to explain the principal uh, direction of what we're trying to do, I'll look at the zero range process. So, yeah, maybe let me start by recalling at least a bit uh, about the facts about the zero range process, what is known there. And again, I emphasize that uh, what I'm showing here is not so particular to the zero range, but we could also look at simple exclusion process or independent particles. So now the zero range process is a discrete space, a continuous time uh, particle process. Uh, you have um, N boxes. So you see the line there from one to N. Each of this is uh, one box. And in each box, there sits a, a natural number of particles, can be zero or any number. So yeah, we have this discrete torus and then we have the state space MN, which uh, determines each configuration of this microscopic system by uh, mapping each box to the number of particles in this box. So this would be the configurations and now you would be interested in the dynamics and these dynamics are random. So first of all, there is uh, the tendency of the particles to actually leave their box and jump uh, to a different box and they will do this at a certain rate. And this rate is uh, determined by the local jump rate function G, which depends on the local number of particles and maps to a probability uh, to jump. Uh, in particular, if there's no particle, then you don't jump, so non-negativity non of the particle number is preserved. And you already see that if we set up things this way, so the, uh, the rate at which particles jump depend on how many particles are around. Uh, this introduces, first of all, an interaction uh, via the number of particles in the box. Uh, and uh, we see that if we already have an eye on the continuum limit and the diffusive behavior, then we would expect to see some kind of nonlinear diffusion in the hydrodynamic limit. Right, so this is the next thing. Um, now, we have uh, determined this local uh, jump rate function, so we know at which rate the particles decide to jump from one box to the other. Uh, and now we still have to uh, determine the probability to jump from box X to jump uh, box Y. So this will be uh, given in terms of a, a transition probability P, which we assume to be translation invariant. So the probability to jump from X to Y just depends on the difference of the two boxes. It can be asymmetric, but uh, it should be centered in the sense that uh, in the mean, we stay stuck. So there's no tendency of the particles to jump, or to prefer to jump right or to prefer to jump left, but on average they stay stuck. So with these ingredients, you can write down the uh, zero range process uh, just by writing down the generator of this uh, process. 
And uh, yeah, what I've explained intuitively of how it works is expressed now in this generator. So we see that uh, we go from a configuration eta to a configuration eta x, y, which means that uh, one particle has jumped from x to y, and this happens at rate g of eta of x. So the rate depends on the number of particles in this uh, box x. And then with probability uh, p, we jump from x to y. And um, yeah, this is a microscopic system of indistinguishable particles. And um, what is nice about it is that we can explicitly write down the invariant probability measures of this process. So now because uh, mass is preserved under the dynamics, uh, we get uh, one parameter family of uh, invariant measures, new row, uh, which is explicitly known, but I don't write them down. And uh, these are the basic objects then to understand uh, the hydrodynamic uh, limit of this process. So what does it mean? Um, so what we want to do is to, instead of looking at this microscopic picture, which will be very complicated when we have a lot of particles, we want to zoom out and speed up the process to see the sort of mean evolution of this microscopic picture. So on the left-hand side, we have the particle picture as before. And then we want to look at this picture from far away. So we see a, a large number of boxes, N, here. And uh, we hope to see a mean evolution, which is a, an evolution of the local density of this microscopic picture. So each point here in the scale X would uh, correspond to a large box of uh, particles and the value, the density here, then to the average density in the box. All right, so this is the intuitive pictures. Uh, to write it down mathematically uh, would mean to write down the empirical density field, uh, just meaning that <clears throat> we rescale our process. So instead of looking at boxes one to n, we rescale the boxes to take uh, values in between zero and one. This is done here. So the boxes are numbered one over n to one. And we speed up time by a factor n square. And there you already see this parabolic scaling that. Uh, Space is uh, rescaled by one over n, but time ends. Okay, and then the empirical density just means that at each of these boxes, we put a Dirac mass and uh, uh, factor in the number of particles sitting in the box. And okay, now we want to understand what happens for large n. So we think of a large system with many particles or many boxes in this case. And we assume that the initial condition is somehow well prepared. So the initial condition already takes the form that for large n, it looks like a slow evolution. Okay, this will not be of particular relevance for us because I'm going to talk mostly about the fluctuations of the dynamics, but as a side remark, okay, this is always assuming that the initial condition behaves nicely. Right, so with this picture now, um, things are quite well understood. Uh, for example, we can uh, compute the hydrodynamic limit, which would correspond in more probabilistic terms to the law of large numbers of this process, meaning that one can show that the empirical density mu n converges to a deterministic object, rho bar, um, which uh, can be written as the unique weak solution to a nonlinear diffusive equation, yeah, which is here. So this is in line with our initial interpretation that having this uh, jump rate function g uh, depending on the local number of particles, would uh, should lead to a non-local diffusion equation. Okay, and I, I'm writing down some particular examples. So you could think of just for uh, to make uh, things precise of something which looks like a Bruce medium uh, uh, diffusion. This is yeah, it's slightly cheating because you don't see this actually in the zero range process, but you have to modify the process a bit. But it gives a good idea on, on what things can look like. Uh, there's a particular case of constant intensity, which gives subdiffusive behavior, and then there's a particular case of independent particles. So when there's actually no dependence on the number of particles in each box, uh, yeah, which, which would give this, uh, this behavior. Right, so, so what does it mean for us? This means that we are actually interested in the microscopic system with a lot of particles, but it's too complicated to actually solve for that one because N is very large. So instead, what we can do is to simulate or analyze the solution to this nonlinear diffusive equation. And this, in terms of this result, 
should give an approximation uh, to the actual behavior of the particle process. But now, of course, this is only true in the limit. Uh, and for a large but finite n, this object, the empirical mass, will still be a, a random object. So there are still fluctuations. They concentrate on this uh, deterministic behavior, but for finite n, fluctuations are still present. So the next thing to do would be to analyze these kind of fluctuations. For example, in terms of uh, central limit theory. And also this, this has been done. So we stay in the same uh, model of the zero range process. So now restrict to constant intensity. Again, assume that the initial condition behaves nice enough and then look at the dynamic fluctuations. So the fluctuation density field would be defined by taking the number of particles and subtracting its mean. So we center our random variables and then again, we put them uh, these values onto the boxes and we change the scaling from one over n to one over square root n as usual in the central limit theory. And if we do this, um, then we can see that then the, the law of these uh, fluctuation fields, uh, yn, they converge weakly to a Gaussian distribution, which then lives on the continuous functions with values and measures or distributions. And this can be identified as a solution to a linear stochastic partial differential equation. So this is a linear equation because, yeah, first of all, this term depends linearly on y. And the noise actually is only additive because the coefficients here don't depend on y. They only depend on the solution rho bar, which was the, uh, the solution to the uh, nonlinear diffusive equation we saw in the last slide. Okay, so yeah, here we already see a stochastic PD popping up, but it's of a linear structure. So then once we have understood the central limit fluctuations, we can uh, ask more, namely about the tail behavior of uh, these uh, Gaussian distributions uh, in terms of large deviation principles. So also this has been done. So I go further now. Let's now say we, we look at the equilibrium situation, that is the initial density is constant, then the, the mean evolution wouldn't change, just as a constant. And now we analyze the probability of uh, the particle system, mu n or large n, to deviate from this uh, hydrodynamic uh, mean behavior. So now we, we look at any given function mu, which maps time into uh, probability distributions and say that it has a density rho. And now this rho doesn't have to be a solution to the hydrodynamic equation, but it's just some function. And we want to estimate the probability that although this is not the behavior we expect in the limit when n tends to infinity, how large the probability is that nonetheless our particle system looks something like this. And this can be estimated uh, in terms of, on the exponential scale in terms of the rate function. So here I write down the corresponding rate function for the dynamic fluctuations, which can be shown to be given as the infimum of the L2 norm of the controls G, uh, so that uh, so so that G is so that this given function rho becomes a solution to the so-called skeleton equation. So this is a form variational form of the rate function that uh, can be explicitly written down in this way. And the skeleton equation will play an important role for us also later. And again, everything that I'm saying is equally relevant in the simpler case where you have really independent particles. So when there's uh, no interactions still, you see this kind of rate function. And you would see here the linear diffusive operator, but already in this uh, independent particle case, the skeleton equation would be a nonlinear equation in this term because it would have the structure of having the derivative of the square root of the density times the control g. Okay, and in this setting, the large deviation principle has been shown. Um, I cite these two works, Kipnis Ola Aradan and Benoit Kipnis and Landim. And okay, I'm just writing down the general form of a large deviation principle here. So either you have seen it, then uh, you know how a large deviation principle looks like, and this is clear. And uh, otherwise, I write down in here this informal uh, way how to interpret it is. So 
let's take the set A, we have here in the statement as just being given formally as a one point, this uh, fluctuation rho, uh, yeah, this little function rho, then the large deviation principle in formally speaking tells us that the probability that the empirical density looks like this given function rho behaves like an exponential to the minus n times the rate function evaluated at rho. Okay, so there are two particular cases here that are interesting. And for example, you could choose rho to be actually rho bar, which was the hydrodynamic uh, limit, the solution to the deterministic equation. Then up here, you can solve this equation with g equals zero, right? Because it was a solution just to this guy. So then the rate function would just be zero. And you would see that here, this probability in the large n limit, it would behave like one which is what we want to see. We want to see that for large n, uh, the probability that mu n looks like uh, the hydrodynamic limit is uh, one, uh, converging to one. And then there's the other case when uh, rho is not the hydrodynamic limit, then the rate function is positive. So the probability to that mu n looks like rho is very small. So since n is large and the rate function is not zero, then this uh, is a very small probability, but uh, also it's uh, possibly non-zero. So these rare events uh, are rare, but can happen. Okay, so far for a very short overview of the uh, fluctuation analysis uh, in this uh, setting of the zero range process. And now I would like to go ahead and display this link to stochastic nonlinear partial differential equations. So the principal aim we start with is that we want to come up with a continuum model. So a model like a PDE or stochastic PDE describing a continuum space object that reflects not only the mean behavior, but also the fluctuations of our microscopic system. So recall that we already have a sort of continuum model, which was this nonlinear diffusive equation, but the nonlinear diffusive equation doesn't see the fluctuations at all. So we want to improve upon this uh, deterministic model. And an ansatz we can take is somehow in analogy to what you know from finite dimensional theory would be uh, overdamped Langevin dynamics. So we look at uh, equations which look like the hydrodynamic equation, but we want to reflect fluctuations. So I just informally write plus fluctuations. But now, of course, the question is how these fluctuations should look like. And there's a, yeah, a general conjecture, and this is sort of what we try to make more precise in this work. Concretely, what is suggested is that you should consider fluctuations of this form. Yeah, so this is a very particular form. It's uh, what we call, so the pure fluctuation term we would call a stochastic conservation law because it has this form of being a divergence of a nonlinear function of the solution times noise. Okay, so it's okay. And it has the form of a conservation law and then there's an interaction with the noise. And this also puts the link to uh, the framework of Hamilton Jacobi equations, since now at least in 1D you can integrate up this equation, then here you would see something which is more like a general P Laplace operator, and here you would see a sort of uh, a stochastic Hamilton Jacobi equation. Yeah, but we'll always work on this level of uh, stochastic conservation laws. Okay, so why now, why am I saying that the fluctuations should look like this? So this is a difficult part in the sense that uh, this equation star does not make uh, any sense. So this is not a well-defined equation because this dWt that I'm writing down here, this is space-time white noise. So this is a very irregular forcing. It's not even, uh, it's not function value. So it's not clear how to make sense, for example, of this product of this guy times space-time white noise. Um, yeah, so any answer we have or we can have here uh, cannot really s uh, state something about the solution row n. So now why still this is the informally at least the correct fluctuation. So there are a number of ways to approach this. 
historically uh, and for a long time, uh, people from physics have uh, suggested this form based on uh, fluctuation dissipation principles, which um, prescribe basically how uh, the fluctuations should be related to the diffusion behavior or dissipation behavior of the equation, which in turn is, deep, is linked to detailed balance uh, conditions and reversibility, where you sort of exploit the gradient structure that you have sitting inside of this diffusion part. And all of this you can, uh, yeah. one term to uh, address this direction in physics would be uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics. Now, yeah, to, to try to put this in maybe more approachable uh, terms from a mathematical perspective, um, you can try to see whether uh, in the limit when n tends to infinity, this model that I'm writing down here, the SPE, at least formally, uh, shows the right fluctuation behavior. So first of all, of course, the mean behavior formally is correct because we have the scaling in front of the fluctuation, so it goes to zero. And we're happy we, we get the hydrodynamic limit as before. Okay, but for this, we wouldn't have had any particular structure of limits. The next thing you can check, and then at this point, you go beyond uh, what the deterministic uh, PDE model could give you, you can study the central limit fluctuations. So we look at our solution, uh, pretend we have one, rho n, we subtract the mean behavior, we scale by a square root, row, a square root of n. So again, the central limit scaling. And then very informally, you can guess that, uh, well, you should see the, the correct uh, fluctuations. So again, there should be a limit y. And y formally should solve, again, the correct stochastic PDE, it's like this uh, linear uh, SPDE that we also saw in the zero range process. OK, so yeah, this already tells us something about the fluctuations. But uh, yeah, if you just have the the restriction that you want to set up a model uh, star here where the noise is such that you see the right central limit fluctuations, then you wouldn't need to choose the fluctuations of this nonlinear form. Okay, you could make a simpler choice and still get the right central limit fluctuations. And where this nonlinear structure really comes in is when you try to also match the large deviation behavior of your SPDE model to the one you want to see from the microscopic picture of the zero range process. And okay, I'm claiming here that indeed this is the case. And again, I'm going to make an informal argument why one could expect or hope uh, that in some sense, this is the right model. So yeah, in this particular example of the zero range process, this has been written down in, in an informal but very nice way by uh, Nicholas Diaz, Dr. Tax and Zimmer in 2016 and this this takes the special case of a very general theory of non-equilibrium statistical physics, which goes under the name of macroscopic fluctuation theory, which was uh, summarized by these authors in a, in a work in 2015 and also has a, a long-lasting history as such. Right, and I'm just repeating uh, so that you can remember this uh, form of the SPDE. And again, I'm emphasizing that even if you go to the seemingly simple case of independent particles, so when the diffusion is just linear, this leads to an SPDE, which uh, actually has attracted a lot of attention and is not at all well understood. So even in the linear case, these things are interesting. Uh, and this, yeah, in this particular case, this would go under the name of the Dean Kawasaki uh, equation. Right, so now I'm claiming that at least informally, pretending everything is fine, this the large deviation behavior of this nonlinear stochastic PDE is the correct one. So why am I saying that? So the, the idea is that um, we can informally apply the contraction principle from large deviation theory uh, in the sense that we just pretend that the solution map, which maps the noise onto the solution row, so we have the map that uh, maps the noise into this equation and then to the solution. And we pretend that this is continuous. So this is certainly false. This is already false for SDEs, but it gives you the right guess of how the rate function should look like. Namely, if you just formally apply the contraction principle, it tells you that the rate function for rho, determine, determining the large deviation behavior, 
it uh, needs to be given by uh, minimizing the rate function of the uh, of the incoming process, so the space-time white noise, over the level sets of the solution map F. Okay, this is just the general form of the um, contraction principle. Now, this object on the right-hand side, we know, because this is now just the rate function of space-time white noise, which you can read off, for example, by looking at Childers' theorem for Brownian sheet, uh, saying that the rate function for space-time white noise is just the L2 norm in space-time. So at this point, really the L2 space in the controls gets fixed. Yeah, and then we minimize over all controls G so that F of G is equal to rho, which just means we minimize over all controls G so that when you replace the noise here by G, rho is a solution. And this is precisely the skeleton equation we already saw before. So now I'm just plugging that in which gives us that informally, the rate function to our SPD would be guessed to have uh, this form. And we see, well, indeed, this is the same form as in the zero range process. So on this informal level, uh, up to large deviations, uh, the fluctuation behavior that our nonlinear SPD uh, suggests uh, is the right one and matches the asymptotics of the zero range process. And, and one could try to go further, so one dream would be to actually show that uh, the SPDE is a better correction or approximates the um, zero range process up to a higher order error than the mean behavior of the hydrodynamic uh, equation uh, does, which is very conceivable to be true if you look at the Fokker Planck equation, but it's something we cannot actually write down explicitly or yeah, clearly, so this is really uh, something maybe for the future. Okay, so now yeah, I sort of, I used the word informally a lot in the last slides and let's go back to that for a second. So what's the problem here? And I already pointed at that. The problem is that this SPD actually doesn't make sense and even if you go to modern, modern theory like regularity structures, uh, so Martin Hyra's theory of regularity structures and singular SPDEs, this doesn't help you because the theory of regularity structures is really based on these stochastic PDEs uh, to be uh, subcritical, meaning that on local scales, the solutions to the singular SPDEs are supposed to be well described by uh, linear parts of the uh, underlying equation. And this is not the case here. So if we do a rescaling, so we zoom in to the equation and look at the behavior locally, then we see that on this level, uh, the noise, so the stochastic conservation law part would dominate. And therefore, yeah, the very basis of this theory does not apply. So this is the first point. Uh, so it would be a tough problem to come up with a web process theory for this equation. And the second problem is that well, it's not even clear if you do that, if you go to the right object, because in regularity structures, typically you have to renormalize the equations. So you don't actually solve this equation, but you have renormalization constants like infinities that you subtract. And it's not at all clear a priori that these renormalization constants don't appear in the rate function. But we don't have any freedom. We know that this is the correct rate function. This is the one we should see in the limit. So we don't want to see any re renormalization constants appearing, which are due to like ultraviolet divergences and singularity of the limits. And this is already something that, at least in principle, you can see in the Phi 4, Phi 3 model, which is a singular SPD where renormalization does appear and where you can also see that the renormalization also appears in the rate functions. And we don't want that. So the question is really how to avoid and uh, prevent renormalization constants appearing. And this leads to the final ansatz. So we reinterpret this fluctuation behavior of the stochastic PDE as a joint two scale limit where we look at an ultraviolet cutoff. So this is like the space time white noise, but projected onto the first K Fourier modes. So this approximation is a process which is smooth in space, but rough in time. 
And we also have the amplitude of the noise. And what we're saying is that we work in the scaling regime where the amplitude of the noise is much smaller than the inverse of the frequency cutoff. Okay, so this cutoff goes to infinity slower than this goes to zero, which leads to the point that if there are renormalization constants that pop up, they will depend on K, but they will be killed by the fast decay of the amplitude. And thereby you would guess that in this scaling regime, which we have to specify more precisely later, uh, one would actually see the, or should actually see the right fluctuation behavior and recover that in this scaling, this stochastic PDEs has a large deviation principle with the correct rate function I of rho as we see it in the zero range process. Okay, and yeah, so, this is somehow the, the end of the first part of the story. So the aim was to motivate the stochastic PD that I put in a box here. So from now on, I, I would try to understand the stochastic PDs in terms of well closeness and then large deviations. And if we can do that, this would uh, link the interpretation of uh, fluctuation hydrodynamics, uh, which was analyzed a lot, for example, by Herbert Spohn and Landau Lifschitz, where um, yeah, fluctuation, fluctuating quantities or fluctuating models uh, of um, were prescribed in terms of stochastic PDEs. Uh, so they took this ansatz and linked this to the macroscopic fluctuation theory ansatz uh, uh, of these authors that I mentioned before. Uh, and the link will precisely be via large deviation principles. So there's a formal link in between these theories and we make rigorous this formal link in this particular example. Okay, so let's go to the stochastic PDE and uh, the large deviation principle. Oops. Okay, and now I'm going to concentrate always on this particular case of the diffusivity being of the porous medium type. So in the paper that I'm presenting, we have general assumptions on phi, but I want to reduce the complexity of notation here a bit. So now always look at this kind of porous medium type equation. So again, I'm recalling that these are the stochastic PDs that we look at, they are of diffusive uh, uh, hyperbolic uh, nature. And the first question would be to actually prove well closeness of these class of SPDs. And this is actually quite recent work. Um, it relies uh, on work uh, by uh, Lyons and Sudanides in the late 90s uh, on stochastic Hammer and Jacobi equations and adapts some of the ideas that was put forward in this series of works to the first the level of conservation laws. This is, goes back to uh, this work by Jonas Kaplan and Sudanides, uh, these two works, uh, where they address somehow purely this part of the equation. And then we extended this theory uh, in the end to, to be able to treat uh, completely these SPDs of, uh, of type star in these last two works. So this settles the well closeness uh, uh, in the setting where we have taken the ultraviolet cutoff. And yeah, from here on, I'm not going to comment on well closeness anymore, but concentrate on large deviation behavior. So yeah, so there are basically two ways of approaching um, the stochastic PDE and to identify the rate function that we expect to see. Uh, the first one being the, taking the limit separately. So first taking the zero noise limit, meaning taking n to infinity and keeping k fixed. Okay, so then we work on this level of uh, the ultraviolet cutoff being fixed and n tending to, to zero. We can establish a large deviation principle on this level. So we get an ADP with a rate function which will depend on the ultraviolet cutoff k. And we can identify them, they look precisely like this. And you see, okay, they have almost the form that we want to see, just that the projection we have uh, put on the noise here, it's put on the control here. 
And then the second step, we can take the ultraviolet cutoff K to infinity and study the gamma convergence of these rate functions against some limit. And we would like to see that then the limit is the correct rate function, which was the guy where this PK is not there. And then an alternative is to look at a joint scaling approach. Uh, so this is based on the so-called reconvergence approach to large deviation principles by uh, Dupuy, Kutiraja, Ellis, and, and co-authors. And doing this reconvergence approach with a joint scaling limit, when it's actually, uh, we're actually able to prove uh, large deviation principles. Now, yeah, concentrating on this gamma convergence for a second, um, this also tells you that in order to prove gamma convergence of these rate functions, what you need to understand really is this skeleton PDE we have in here. So once we have understood where postness and stability of this PDE, then proving gamma convergence is a simple consequence. And the stability we have to understand in the sense that well, when we look at the gamma convergence, we only know that we have a sequence of controls which has bounded A2 norms, so it's weakly convergent. And we have to understand that if we plug in something here which is weakly convergent, that then the solutions converge strongly. If we can do that, then the gamma convergence will follow immediately. So I summarized that on the next slide. So in order to prove an ADP, okay, there's a bunch of sort of overhead or things that you have to do, but the really hard part would be to understand the skeleton PDE. And so now this is a difficult problem because this is a, an equation with coefficients which are very irregular in the sense that G, the, the control is just an A2 function. And we don't know anything more. So this A2 came from the rate function of space-time white noise. So there's, there's no degree of freedom for us here. Yeah? And this is not looking so promising. So if you know theory by Dupin Alliance and Ambrosi on renormalized solutions uh, and, and Lebris on renormalized solutions, then for example, you could consider the case M equal two, then you have here really a convective equation, a linear convective term. And you see that the convection term has an homogeneity, which is just L2. And yeah, thinking of the classical theories, uh, there you would need G to be a font variation and have uh, divergence bounded, for example. So on first sight, maybe you might be pessimistic actually for this equation, but things are a bit different because we have this nonlinear diffusive equation uh, operator, and this actually has a stronger tendency to prevent concentration. Right, so, so the problem would be to understand existence and uniqueness of solutions to stars. So set up some kind of weak uh, uh, solution concept and prove the way postness. And second, the stability of solutions. So when the controls converge weakly, we need to show that the corresponding solutions converge strongly. Okay, so yeah, how do you approach this kind of problem? So what, what I did when we looked at this equation first, I tried to de derive stable AP estimates in order to see what kind of regularity I would uh, expect from solutions, and that doesn't work. So yeah, you can try a bit and then see that for any AP space, uh, the estimates don't close up. And, and of course, it's the question if this is uh, due to lack of trying or if there's actually something which goes on. And you could be afraid that actually you might see concentration of mass, so concentration in Dirac masses of mass. So, yeah, this this starts the um, the question of where postness of the skeleton equation, and to get an idea of how difficult this problem should be, again, let's start with making a scaling argument. So. Let's replace the control G by a general control in a QAP and the initial condition by some initial condition in LR. And now we take a solution to this equation, pretend we have one, and we rescale it by zooming in. And then we study how locally, so after zooming in, this equation looks like. And now we would call this equation subcritical again if on local scales the diffusivity uh, dominates, which would mean that you expect your solutions to look regular. If the equation is supercritical, it means that on local scale the divergence part uh, dominates, so locally it looks like uh, the equation with this guy gone, and then you're dead, right? Because if you just have this uh, 
uh, very regular uh, conservation law, then there's no way you uh, um, prevent concentration. Right, so there's good and bad news in this regard. So from scaling argument, we can see that the critical space for the control G is P and Q equal to two, which is precisely the setting we are in. So it doesn't rule out that we do have well postness, but it also tells us what it's the critical uh, regime. So in this critical regime, even after zooming in, both of these operators act on the same scale. So that's still present. And it also tells us that uh, in terms of the, oh, sorry, in terms of the initial condition, um, and one is critical and for all arc strictly bigger than one, the equation is super critical. So it was not in terms of lack of trying that we couldn't uh, close LP estimates or LR estimates here, but it's, it's really impossible. Right, so things should be good in L1, but that doesn't really help, but because working in L1 just means that mass is preserved, which still doesn't uh, rule out concentration. So at this point, really, uh, yeah, a new idea going away from AP estimates is needed. And so what turns out to be possible is to look at uh, entropy, entropy dissipation. So instead of looking at the evolution of AP norms, we look at the evolution of Boltzmann entropy of this classical form, rho log rho. And then we can do, yeah, we just make an informal computation and see that then informally the entropy should be controlled. We have an entropy dissipation term, which gives us this form of non-standard regularity of having one derivative on this power of the density. And things are just controlled in terms of the control uh, G in L2 norm, which is good because this is the only thing we know. And already there's a warning. This can only be true for non-negative solutions. This you can already see in the linear. Right, so this is the regularity we have and nothing more. And based on that, we now should set up a weak solution theory. So the first thing to do is to see that where well, we should actually write our equation in terms of these guys and not in terms of rho to the power m. So we write down this sort of non-standard way of writing weak solutions to a brute force minimum equation by rewriting the diffusive operator in this term. And then we're sort of happy because, well, this is L2, this is L2, so at least we can write down a weak solution. Right, and then, yeah, the difficulty, of course, is how to prove now uniqueness in this class of weak solutions that, uh, well, solve this PDE in a distributional sense and have regularity in terms of having bound entropy and having this uh, entropy dissipation fine. And the way we proceed here is by extending and adapting the concepts of renormalized solutions to the concept of renormalized entropy solution in the setting. So this extends concepts by De Perna and Lyons and Ambrosio to the setting of nonlinear PDs. So the idea here is that as for the linear case, um, instead of only looking at rho being a solution to the initial PDE, we request that also nonlinear functions of rho are again solutions to some kind of PDE. So in the linear case, which was treated by, by these authors here, um, a renormalized solution would be a solution to a transport equation if e also nonlinear functions of it. Uh, again, solutions to the same transport equation. So this works in the in the linear setting. Now we have nonlinear equations, so there will be sort of entropy dissipation appearing when we make the statement. And um, a convenient way to in, encapsulate somehow a large enough family of entropies is by the kinetic solution theory. So we introduce this kinetic function chi, which has this particular form. And the nice thing about this ansatz of kinetic functions is that then, okay, and, and on an informal level, we can write down uh, an equation for this nonlinear function of the solution again. Okay, it's more complicated than the initial PDE because it's a nonlinear PDE, but okay, you can you can write it down and you can identify what the objects are, and so you would expect maybe an inequality here because you have entropy dissipation. This is captured in this last term, the derivative of some measure, which is the so-called parabolic defect measure, which precisely captures the 
uh, the dissipation of entropy. Okay, so yeah, you can formally write this down and then we would call a renormalized entropy solution a uh, solution rho, which is such that these function chi defined in this way are also solutions to the kinetic equation. So if the solutions were regular, then this will always be the case. But since they are not, um, it's not clear a priori if a weak solution is automatically a renormalized solution because when you compute this equation for chi, you take chain rules, so you take the derivative here on chi, meaning you pull them in here, so you use a chain rule which is not substantiated by the regularity you have at hand. Right, so, yeah, and this is the idea somehow now how to enforce this or how to prove that weak solutions are indeed renormalized solutions. We um, extend ideas by dependent alliance in the sense that we now take convolutions of the solution row. So we make this guy, we force it to be uh, more smooth by convolving against the smooth function. But then this uh, approximating version of rho, while it's being smooth, it doesn't satisfy the equation anymore. And this is the error, which are called commutator errors, we have to fight against. So yeah, I want to explain this in one equation on the next slide. So as I said, we enforce rho to become smooth by convolving with a smooth kernel. But then we need to compute now what the rho epsilon actually satisfies as an equation. And these three qualities, they are really yeah, basic. So I'm just using that rho as a solution. I'm commuting convolution with the kernel with uh, taking derivatives. So up to here, nothing happened. And now I just force in what I want to see. So I want to see that rho epsilon is again a solution for the original equation. So I, I just write these terms in here. So with these guys, I'm happy, but then I have the errors I'm making. So first I'm, I'm making the error that I commute, taking the convolution with taking the mth power. So this is this guy. Then the same one here. So I come take the, uh, I interchange taking convolution with taking the m half power here. And then this last commutator is a bit more classical because it means that I, uh, I commute taking the convolution with taking the product with g. Yeah, so this, this last term you would also see when you work in the linear setting. Uh, this is somehow the uh, commutator error you would see also in terms in form of transport equations, for example. And now the task uh, in order to justify that weak solutions are renormalized solutions um, lies in identifying that these uh, commutator errors that we make to control them and show that when epsilon tends to zero, these guys actually tend to zero. And this is the case where also in the linear setting, you typically need assumptions on the driving control, so on G. Yeah, so I mentioned that in a work before. So this classical theory applies for G being a bounded variation. So for us, it's just L2. So yeah, you might again think, well, why should this be possible? But the point is that in our setting, we work with solutions rho, which have finite entropy dissipation. So we know that this guy still has one derivative. And we have to use this regularity now in order to control the uh, commutator error. Mm -hmm. And this is... This is a large chunk of the work because there we have to be very careful. We have to exploit really this kind of optimal regularity in this non-standard form in order to show that the commutator errors go to zero. And yeah, there are additional difficulties because we only have little integrability. So these products are only a one, which is not enough to justify some computations. So we have additional renormalization steps to look. Okay, so, but yeah, after enduring all these, this work, it, it turns out that it's possible and we proved that indeed in the setting of uh, yeah, irregular Cruz media equations here, we can show that any weak solution is indeed a renormalized entropy solution in this sense. And now once you have done that, uh, of course, we're still left with a problem to prove uniqueness. So now we have moved it to prove uh, to the challenge to prove uh, uniqueness of renormalized entropy solutions. 
So now again, taking this comparison to the linear case, in the linear case, once you've shown that weak solutions are renormalized, then everything is easy. Uh, basically, the proof is immediate after that. And this is not the case here anymore because we're in this nonlinear setting. So what we have to do is to adapt these uh, techniques of a variable doubling, which are the classical techniques to reduce to prove uniqueness of entropy solutions for conservation laws, and then extend it by Chen and Tap Tam uh, to sort of yeah, these sort of parabolic hyperbolic equations, but in Chen and Tap Tam with the G being smooth or even constant. And we have to adapt these, these techniques now into our setting of low regularity. And what this means, this kind of variable doubling, is again that you see objects appearing which are somewhat reminiscent of uh, commutator errors again. So again, we have to control these uh, commutator errors uh, in the setting of low regularity. And again, we uh, crucially rely on having these kind of optimal regularity estimates coming from the finite entropy dissipation. And for those of you who are familiar with these kind of proofs of uniqueness of kinetic solutions or entropy solutions, uh, one fact which is used in these proofs is that the entropy dissipation uh, becomes small when the velocity psi becomes large. And this fact ceases to be true in our setting due to the low regularity because, well, the entropy dissipation measure just is this guy. There's nothing we can do about this and this growth in psi. So this actually grows, becomes large when velocity becomes large. We lose this property and this creates additional problems in the proof of uniqueness. And these are points where yeah, new ideas were needed. Okay, so again, yeah, I'm summarizing There's a lot of paper, uh, pages here, but yeah, this gist of the story is that also this works and we end up with a complete uh, for the sake of what we want, a complete result in terms of the skeleton equation. So we show that for controls G being L2 functions and initial conditions having finite entropy, there's a unique weak solution to uh, our parabolic hyperbolic equation with G being an L2. And we prove uniqueness in terms of establishing such a contraction principle. And in addition, there's this um, weak stability. So if the controls converge weakly in L2, we show that the corresponding solutions converge strongly in L1. And yeah, which I indicated in a nutshell a few slides ago that this should be the key ingredient when you want to prove gamma convergence of the approximating rate functions. And following the theory of Putiraja, Dupuy, and co-authors, of uh, the weak approach to the large deviation principle. Also, this is the key ingredient you need to establish in order to prove an LDP. So once we have done or written down this theorem, um, the conclusion is sort of almost immediate. Uh, so we go back to our stochastic PDE. We look at the joint scaling limit where the uh, amplitude, uh, the, the frequency cutoff goes to infinity and the amplitude goes to zero. And now we specify precisely the regime. So it should go in, yeah, we should be here. So this means that the frequency cutoff does not tend to infinity too fast in comparison to the noise amplitude. Then in this case, uh, we show that um, this rate function I'm writing down here is indeed a rate function and that the densities, so the solutions to our uh, stochastic PDEs indeed satisfy a large deviation principle with this rate function i, which again is precisely the same rate function as we have seen to be the correct one in the setting of the zero range process. So in this slide, Bye. this this finishes the, uh, the presentation uh, as we see that uh, this SPE indeed shows the correct fluctuation behavior in terms of uh, central limit theorem and blood deviations. Okay, so yeah, I'd like to close up the talk by giving you the references. Uh, everything I've said here is contained in this work with Ben Fairman. Uh, the well postness of the stochastic PDs that we have seen is in, done in this form in these two works, which build upon ideas on, on this previous work with uh, Takis uh, on stochastic conservation. 
Okay, and I believe my time is up. So yeah, thank you very much.